Wonderful. Well, it's uh, good to be here. I've been looking forward to giving this presentation for quite some time. Uh, Mike, are we good? All right. Um, and I'm going to do my best to keep within an hour. I did my first dry run of this. It was an hour and a half, and I know those seats aren't the most comfortable in the world, so I will do my best to stay within an hour. I will say my, you know, my job as an interpretive ranger is to help connect people to the interesting stories that surround us. And one of my biggest interests is geology, I also uh, volcanism, caves, all that stuff. And I just love exploring that with folks. So that's what we're gonna do today, help you understand our geologic story here in St. George, especially the volcanic story, which if, as you look around, you see them all over the place. Uh, this is a very volcanically active area. So um, we're gonna dive into that. And at the end, I'd be happy to stick around for questions. Um, I'm sure there will be. Um, just wanted to show really quick what you were watching. This is Anak Krakatoa in Indonesia. Um, but the reason I showed that, other than the fact that it's cool, is that that kind of showering of um, cinders, we had that Santa Clara cinder cone, uh, the, the one in Hurricane, that they all did that for a while. So um, that is a St. George story, too. Is everyone hearing me all right? Yes. Great. Okay. Whoa. Oh, okay. All right. So, you know, not, not Santa Clara cinder cone, but close enough, again, what we would have seen here. And just to show, since most folks don't know where the, mo the monument I work at is, it's on the Arizona Strip. It's a million acres in size. It's between St. George and uh, St. George, Grand Canyon. So that green outline there, that's the monument. It's 80% Bureau of Land Management, 20% Park Service, but we manage it together. Um, we've got about 20 employees at Parashant. I've been there about eight years, absolutely love it. We've got incredible scenery. If you've not been out there, you do need a four by four with all-terrain tires to get out there, um, but you don't necessarily need uh, a lifted Jeep for some of the most scenic viewpoints. Um, Twin Point's one of my favorites. Another one, and this, the Twin Point, you go out there, you're gonna have a piece of the Grand Canyon all to yourself. It's not like going to the National Park where there's thousands of people around you. Um, I've been out there dozens of times, and I think two or three times I've seen someone else. So, uh, beautiful spot. Another one is Whitmore Canyon Overlook. We're actually gonna come back to Whitmore Canyon Overlook to talk about lava dams in the Grand Canyon, uh, but there's a road that goes right down almost to the river, You're about a thousand feet above it. But we're here to talk about volcanoes. This is my first volcano. Loved going here. And I don't know if some of you may actually recognize this in its old form. <laughs> but yeah, I would love to you go to Ape Cave and see the lava caves there. This guy's in a tree cast. Lava knocked a tree down, the tree rotted out. Now you can crawl through it if you don't mind tight spaces. Uh, really fun. But of course, we all know that this didn't last. Um, that beautiful cone is now destroyed and it's a big crater, it's Mount St. Helens. I was five years old, living in Aberdeen, Washington. I distinctly remember looking out that glass patio door and seeing gray snow falling and was fascinated and I wanted so badly to go out and play in it. My mom said no, uh, for good reason. That ash is basically microscopic shredded glass. So not the stuff you want in your lungs. So that was my first volcanic memory, and it's stuck with me ever since. Um, Mount St. Helens today, the most active volcano in the Cascades. It's um, the, the lava dome in the middle of the crater is still growing. I was talking to some folks up at the Cascade uh, Volcanic Observatory with the US Geological Survey, and they were saying that um, this, co this crater could fill in in the next 50 to 100 years because that dome is growing so fast, if it keeps its growth rate. So um, it just keeps growing and, and doing its thing. But let's get closer to home, shall we? Um, I want to start out with Santa Clara Cinder Cone because it's a fun hike. If you've not hiked up it, it's great. It's not very long. I think you gain, I don't know, 500, 600 feet. And if you've done it in the past, there used to be a scramble at the top. You'd want leather gloves because it's, you fall and you don't want to scrape your hands up on the cinders. But the, the state park has actually put in switchbacks to the top now. So it's much easier to get up there. And then you walk the rim. It's, it's really neat, um, beautiful spot. 
A couple other local sites, uh, this is a couple names, Sullivan Knoll or Volcano Mountain, right in Hurricane. This thing is actually, that cone I believe is the more recent one, but that spot has erupted twice. Our volcanic story in this basin goes back several million years. Um, if you've ever been out at night and you've looked southeast of town, you see that mountain with the red blinking lights on it. This is not the one that's right off of, uh, what's it, Brigham Road. This is the one about 15 miles outside of town. That's actually a 2.5 million year old volcano. And if you look across, when you're looking out there, Sieg Miller, and you look just to the west, there's another one called um, um, Wolf Hole, I think. Um, and then another one, Black Rock Mountain. And so there's actually a line of volcanoes out there, and they're all a couple million years old. But not of all of our volcanism is that old. Uh, this one may be familiar to you. This is a fascinating one, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but this is right where I-15 cuts through that gap by the outlet mall. And this is a 1.5 million year old flow, and it's sitting on the Kayenta Formation. And this is a tough thing to look at because if you're driving, you can't focus on anything but all the crazy traffic. But if you're a passenger and you have a second, look up between the lava flow and the Kayenta formation, the red, the red rock. Look at this stuff, this tan material. That's riverbed material. And if you look really close, there, look at those rounded rocks. Those are pieces of the Pine Valley Mountains that have been tumbled in a river smooth and round. So this lava flow went down what was a stream bed, filled it in, and then as happens around here, everything erodes um, except what's underneath lava rock. And so that used to be the low point right there, and the valley walls went up like that. But erosion basically took all that down, and so we call these inverted valleys. Now, a really old volcanic story, and I don't have time to get into it today, but it's the Pine Valley Mountains, about 2.5, 20.5 million years old. It's a lacolith, which means magma came up, did not erupt on the surface, and inflated a big chamber beneath the surface. Um, and it's, it's, I guess, the largest one, at least in North America, if not the world. But one of the things with geology is when you're looking at the landscape and you're trying to figure it out, it's not just what's there, but what's not there. And I was thinking about it, I was like, well, it's, you know, it's big, I guess, but it's, I've seen the LaSalle Mountains, that's a lacolith, the Henry Mountains, a lacolith. And it occurred to me, wait a minute, what's gone? What's missing? And it's great being here in Leeds, because when you go out the door here, you see all the quartz monzonite, that's is what the lacolith's made out of, it's a type of granitic rock, boulders all over the place. They're down in the Virgin River, they're sprinkled all the way down the Virgin to the Colorado. I found a paper they, that, and I haven't found a better answer than this, but it's estimated that up to 75% of the lacolith is already gone. So this is just what's left. So, and you'll see it in the landscape, and that's one of its boulders right there. And that, yeah, so that's the Pine Valley Mountains. Beautiful lacolith. All right, so next concept, and this is kind of a volcanic volcanology 101 I'm doing here today. Um, the Santa Clara volcanic field is what we're in. Now, if you're in the Cascade Mountains, you get, you know, Mount Rainier or Mount St. Helens, and it erupts from the same place all the time. In volcanic fields, it's different. This is a big region where lava could come out at any time, any place. And so I put in Plinko there because it's kind of like reverse Plinko. Beneath us, and by the way, Earth's crust here is about 15 miles thick. You go down 15 miles and you're in the mantle, Earth's mantle. It's not very far away. And right there are pockets of magma. And in this zone, which is you know 100 miles, 100 square miles, maybe more, the lava starts to rise. And we'll talk more about the lava rise later, but as it's rising, it's going from really soft, lower crust and mantle that's like, you know, this, the rocks are very soft and very hot, to rocks that are like this. And so as the magma gets to that brittle zone, it has to find a path, and we're really close to the Hurricane Cliff, right, and several other major faults it uses those faults to get the rest of the way to the surface. And then the last little bit 
you know, whatever the cracks work best for that magma, it just kind of and comes out anywhere. So none of our volcanoes are going to erupt in the same place twice. The Santa Clara cinder cone will never erupt again. Other volcanic fields, this one's in Parashant, a little bit in the Grand Canyon. Should be pretty obvious what we're looking at there. All that dark material is lava. And we're going to be using Google Earth quite a bit uh, today, so you can see where it's pouring into the Grand Canyon. A couple eruptions on the south side on the Wallapai Reservation. So that's Parashant's volcanic field. Another one that's extinct, this one's west or east of Flagstaff, the Hopi Buttes volcanic field. And you can see just how many of uh, the, the uh, remnants of these old volcanoes there are. It's a beautiful drive to go through there. Um, these particular ones erupted in kind of a swamp land. Um, I'm not sure how they figured that out, but I'd like to learn that one of these days. Um, but anyways, yeah, so you can see erosion is now leaving these buttes standing up, whereas before they were actually buried in the ground. So. Another one, San Francisco volcanic field. This is uh, Flagstaff. This one's a whopper, 600 plus eruptions in this volcanic field over the last six million years. And it's the home of Sunset Crater, which erupted about 930 years ago. Another one, this one's got a, a bit of a naughty name, so we'll just use its initials, SP Crater. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, so this one thought, was thought it erupted about 70,000 years ago, but that didn't make sense because this thing is so fresh and that lava flow almost has no dirt filling it in, nothing growing on it. Some new work was done and they think it's about 4,000 uh, years old. So pretty recent. Uh, this one's, um, it's, it's actually on private land on uh, Babbitt, um, former Secretary of the Interior, who actually created Parashant. Um, but you can go visit this, but it's um, between, the, um, between Flagstaff and Cameron. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, and so folks can visit it, hike to the top. Now this one is another one. I just put this in because this is uh, amusing to me. Um, I saw this on Google Earth and I was like, what the heck is going on? So clearly this is a secretive billionaire's lair, right? <laughs> um, so this is... Yeah, so this is Rod Rod Rodin, I guess, crater. Um, it's actually, I believe, on Arizona's University of Arizona land, but an artist got permission to basically make this into a solar observatory. So you can pay like $6,000 and go in and look at the stars. Um, I guess Kanye West donated $10 million for the guy to finish it. So I just, when I saw that, I was like, what in the world? Is that some secret military base? Uh, James Bond kind of thing. Anyways. Moving back, let's get to Utah. Now you might be looking at this and saying, what are you talking about, volcano in a lake? What? <laughs> All right, well I had to get in my time machine to take that picture 19,000 years ago. Um, this is Pavant Butte, and this is near Delta. This is a volcano that erupted in Lake Bonneville during the last ice age. So just imagine that, and you can actually see the shoreline of Lake Bonneville right there. So this erupted in the lake, and it actually caused a really interesting, unusual thing. So the next slide, it's just gonna just kind of give you an idea. Make sure this volume is up. The deepest body of water on the planet. This is Kavachi in the Solomon Islands. <laughs> I don't know if you can all hear One that. the most active undersea volcanoes in the world. So, of course, it's Pavant Butte, not Kavachi. <laughs> all right. So I want you to take note of the color in the water. That, there we go. That orange color. So when you go to Pavant Butte, if you do, it's orange. And it's called pelagonite. That's what you get when lava rock or liquid magma, I guess, encounters water. So it, it degrades, um, changes chemically. So it's not your typical sort of black uh, scoria, the cinders. So that's just a really neat sort of side story. Um, great place to go. And I'm going to leave the slideshow. 
And we're going to do another thing. I figured out how to do this in Google Earth. We're going to do a volcano tour. No, darn it. Stop. There we go. Of our area. Okay, so we're zooming in, starting at St. George. So St. George, Pine Valley Mountains in the background. Now we're going to the old airport. All right, so the old airport is built on another inverted valley. So this lava flow is about 1.1 million years old and they built the airport on it. And the one right next to it, which is a little higher, is about 2.1 million years old. So this one. And both of these lava flows came from vents up here on the flanks of Pine Valley Mountain. The Pine Valley Mountain, the Lackalith, that story's dead geologically. It's not a part of this. But it's just a coincidence that there were a lot of eruptions right up here, and they fled, uh, flowed down. You can see pieces of it there. Um, and the thing with inverted valleys, and it gives you, again, this idea of how fast things erode around here. This is higher than this. This is older than this. So, and now, this is the ground. So, that used to be ground level, erosion happened, that was ground level, and now that's ground level. So this area, St. George, is eroding fast. So we'll just go up really quick to those uh, vents. There's some forest service roads you can take to get to those. They're right up here. I climbed one of the top of them. It's pretty neat views. Are but fissures or are they cinder cones? Um, so they're cinder cones, um, and they're really they're about 300 to 600,000 years old, the newest ones, so they're starting to get pretty eroded, especially at that elevation. So they're all covered with ponderosas, or not ponderosas, pinions, uh, so they're a little hard to spot. Gotcha. So this next one's the Washington cinder cone. And this one's about 900,000 years old, and it's lava flow. And you should be able to whoops, see how it's just following an old stream winding along. That's pretty funny. Yeah, and they put the freeway through it. <laughs> and so this lava flow got down to the Virgin River, probably blocked it for a little while. Now they're building houses on it. Yeah, great place for a bike ride. All right, now we got Volcano Mountain in Hurricane. And two others that are off to the other side. This is Radio Towers and Cinder... Mm -hmm. So there's quite a few of these in Hurricane. Now we're going to one of my absolute favorites. This one's called, wait for it, Crater Hill. <laughs> Very creative. Um, so this one is great um, because it's, it's situated right below the West Temple. And I like to think, is when this was going off about 120,000 years ago, the, the big showers of cinders um, maybe would have even glowed at night on the West Temple. How cool would have that been to see? And then just to really quickly look at its lava flow. So you can see it hit the uh, Virgin River and then headed downstream. But I want to zoom in right here. Next time you drive over to Zion and you go drive by this spot, the river, the original riverbed goes under the lava flow here. So the lava filled it in. And this used to be over here. And so you had that, that old, I don't know what that is, Kanta maybe. Uh, oh, it was Moenkopi, thank you. Yeah, and so it and the lava came together, formed a lake that flowed ba or filled back in all the way to the visitor center of Zion um, and lasted there quite a while. And it was, of course, that river is so full of dirt that it filled in, created a really nice wetland. There was probably a pretty waterfall over the end of the lava flow until the river cut itself a path um, where it is today. We're going to go up Kolob Terrace really quick to spend love and um, fire pit knolls. Oh, is it? Is that? <laughs> and then we're going up to Kolob Terrace itself. Now, 1.1 million, there was a lot of activity about 1.1 million years ago. Came out of here, huge lava flow. And when you go to Lava Point at Zion National Park, that's that lava flow. 
You can see again the grayish rocks there. And that came from those sandstone mm -hmm. uh, Yep, wow. yeah. So here's the thing. This was such a voluminous eruption that this flowed down all the way back down to the Virgin River. And I don't know, that, I think this might be called Dalton Mesa, but also it's right above Virgin. Oh, is that it? Dalton Flats? Yeah. Well, Dalton Flats is lower, but go up to Moline Mesa is where you would get it. Is that, oh, is that what it's called? Okay. It's a good mountain biker's call it. Yeah. Oh. Sounds like a mountain biker yeah. <laughs> name. So yeah, so this is that same flow that's way up at Lava Point. Wow. And who knows how far that went down the Virgin River. All evidence past here is gone. Okay, now we're going to go over to Santa Clara Cinder Cone, and its sister cone, the Diamond Valley Cone. So this one's on private land, which is for sale. I'd love to buy it, but don't have whatever it costs. Um, and they don't actually have a date on this one yet. The, we know that Santa Clara is about 32,000 years old. This one, the interesting thing is, these are its, oh, pointing to the screen, you guys can't see that. <laughs> these, these are its flows, and when you do the trail, you can see how they kind of ran up onto the cone there, and then the, the flow stops here. So this was a much smaller eruption, uh, but it's more recent. So we need to know when that is, because that is the youngest eruption so in St. George. The youngest in the area. Mm -hmm. Yep, that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can we ask questions? Sure. Like, the uh, Santa Clara one, did that lava flow into Moline Mesa? Did that go the same way? It did. As a matter of fact, we're going to follow it right now. So, yeah, it flowed down into Snow Canyon State Park. Okay. And when you go there, this is the thing. There's been, there have been so many eruptions here, it starts to become a, a real mix. So the one that's right on the valley floor, that's from the Santa Clara cinder cone. This, that has those really beautiful black rock cascades down the Navajo sandstone, this came from those vents way up here, and this is another one-ish million year old flow. So you, they all start mixing together there, but the most recent one's right on the valley floor. And this flow went nine miles, I think all the way to, what's it called, Sunbrook there, somewhere there. So it went quite a ways. Entrada, okay. Another one that's neat. On the which one? Yeah, that's the 32,000. Yeah. Yeah, and then this one's the Veo Cinder Cone, 690,000. It's a nice hike to the top. There is no trail. This is another one that might blow your minds a little bit. So, a lot of vents, a lot of eruptions all through here that flowed down. There's a whole mess of cones along the Highway 18 here. But we're going to get up into Pine Valley, where there were 11 eruptions. One of them's tucked back in here, but there's several cones right in this area. And one of them is pretty important for Pine Valley settlement because it made a lava flow that blocked the Santa Clara River, made a lake, which filled in and became very nice for farming and grazing. So that's why Pine Valley is so flat right there. It's a lava flow lake uh, that filled in. All right, another thing. Google, you know, if you get Google Earth, um, it's, just, it's fun to look at, just looking at your landscape. Going past the Veo Cone, getting close to Gunlock. I think you're able to recognize these features now. We got a lava flow following the old Santa Clara Riverbed. So this was the riverbed, now it's over to the right. I have a question, so is it actually kind of shaped like that riverbed was? Like that exactly, yeah, so it's like a mold. Yeah, it really is, it's, it's beautiful. It allows us to go back in time and see what used to be. All right, now we're in Cedar City and Cedar Breaks, right there, but we're not talking about Cedar Breaks today. We're talking about all the volcanism just to the east of it. Now, for some reason, Google Earth didn't really show these cones very well, but you can see all the gray material, Panguitch Lake, and this, which you can see right off the road. These are really high lava flows, just a jumble of rocks. 
And it's a little higher silica, so it's thicker, so the lava's higher and moves a little more slowly. What's that? Uh, there is a cone. The, the, the cones up there are actually not as peaky as some of the other ones. They're, they're a little more, uh, what do you call that? It's just low and broad. Like, uh, like this one is actually, this is a cone. That's the top right there. And so that whole thing kind of slopes out. Um, so that's Navajo Lake right there. So pretty close to Duck Creek. And this flow, which may be one to 2,000 years old, blocked Duck Creek and made the original Navajo Lake. I think it's a little bigger now because they put a dam in. But you can see the lava goes right up to it. All right, we're going to leave Utah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, probably mostly the really spotty cell service we have around here. <laughs> I tell you, you know, I'm not pitching for Verizon, but I do find that Verizon seems to work better in our remote areas. Uh, I guess AT&T is better in cities, but yeah, no, not, not with that. All right, going out on the Arizona Strip, and we're getting into Parashant. Hurricane Cliffs, and you can see again, lava flows. What's really interesting about the Uinkaret volcanic field that is in Parashant is we have on the west side the Hurricane Fault and on the east side the Toraweep Fault, the two most active faults in Arizona. And for some reason all these volcanoes, you can see all those cones, didn't come up right on, most of them didn't come up on the fault, they came between them in these weird lines. So that's an area that geologists don't quite understand why that's happening. Uh, about nine miles-ish. So they're really close together. And they're both uh, basin and range detachment faults. So, yeah. Something, there's something with the physics of it that makes it easier for these things to come out. Um, but it's, it's just one of the mysteries that is being researched. So that's a huge flow that's about 87,000. And if you want to see this, again, just need a high clearance vehicle with all-terrain tires, and it'll get you right down into the Grand Canyon. All right, I'm going to pause the video here for just a moment. Lava coming down, many, many flows, filled in the original valley. So now this creek, which is dry most of the times over here, but this was the original valley. That's where the road stops. But look over here. Look at that. That's the exact same basalt as that. Draw a line. There's your lava dam. Yep. So it blocked the Colorado River. Um, imagine that. I mean, it, it would have poured in there, made a huge plug right here. But then it's not the end of the story because these lava flows were huge and they just kept producing lava. So once the dam was there, boiling away the river and then just blocking it, um, the lava kept flowing downstream. So imagine, I don't know, you're a fox and you're you know, living next to the river and all of a sudden the river's gone. There's dead you know, fish flopping in the mud, and there's no water. Um, in the distance is a, a rumbling sound, and then around the corner comes this 50 to 100 foot high wall of lava coming right at you. <laughs> and that's what happened. So the Colorado River got cut off for at least months, if not a couple of years. Uh, no, but we're going to get there next, because uh, there were some lava flows there. So this one's Whitmore Canyon. We call that Whitmore Canyon Overlook. Um, so yeah, so it and just so if you were downstream of there, you know, the Colorado River would have just been gone, like down, you know, um, southern what's what's today southern Arizona, you know, Yuma area, just no water. And there was a huge wetland that depended on this river in the Gulf of California. Just the water was cut off. So something went. It was some bad times for a while. That one, 179,000. That occurred 179,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. The most recent one is um, at Lava Falls from Vulcan's Throne, 72,000-ish years ago. And so you can see the lava just cascading down there from that eruption. I'm going to pause right there. 
One of the things that's so cool about Vulcan's throne is it's sitting right on the Torah Weep Fault. It goes right through it and that away. So that's the fault itself right there. Um, it's cross section. Notice this notch at the top of Vulcan's throne. The fault is still very active. The fault is splitting it in half. Yeah. So that's another area of very active geology. This will erupt again, um, this area. Um, and we will have a lava dam again one of these days. And that dam only lasted a few years? Mm hmm. Yeah, there was a researcher named Hamlin back in the 90s. And one of the things, which is actually a perfect, perfect time to ask that question, um, he was looking at lava material over here, and it would have made a lava dam almost a half mile high. And he postulated that that would have, if it was a good dam, backed a lake all the way to Moab. Whoa. Which is cool to think about. The problem is new research is showing that these lava dams are terrible at being dams. They're so full of cracks and holes that the, the lake, there was some kind of lake, but how big it was is unknown. Um, I'm actually, believe it or not, going to be, I, can, I can't believe this, I'm going to be joining USGS in about two weeks on a float trip through the Grand Canyon. We're actually going to be sampling here to see if we can find the basalt that's here that matches over here to see if Hamlin's Dam actually did exist. Because the other thought is it only filled it halfway, like the lava dam was like that, and then the river just went around it. So that's a, that's a mystery. But this is the other site of many dams. There were a total of at least 17 during the last uh, million years. Yeah, yeah, right, right there. Right there yeah. So I want to zoom into something else. This is just incredible. Vulcan's anvil, or Vulcan's forge, I think it's also known as. Um, famous river rafting location to stop at and look at. That's a volcanic neck. That means a volcano erupted in the bottom of the Grand Canyon <laughs> through the Colorado River, made a cinder cone, blocked the river, did all that, and now all that's left is its stock, which is the, with the magma chamber, the tube that the lava came up. And Vulcan's Thrones in Grand Canyon National Park. We're just next to it. We're back in Parashant now. This is Little Springs. This is our second youngest eruption in Arizona about 960 years ago. And it was on a ridge line, so the lava flow went two different directions. And that's Mount Trumbull, which is a pretty famous landmark. There's something on it, though, that I noticed that really caught my attention. And I wish we had a date on it, but we don't yet because we cannot find its lava flow, and it's this cinder cone right there. This is a cinder cone that erupted through Mount Trumbull. Now, usually, you know, I said they don't erupt in the same place, and technically this is a half mile from the original Mount Trumbull eruption 3.6 million years ago, but if you can judge by all the trees on it, this is probably several 10,000 years old, if not a couple hundred thousand. So woolly mammoth, or woolly, Colombian mammoths and um, Saber-toothed cats saw this go off, but we don't know if uh, people were around that long ago in this area. Um, but I'd like to think of this as the lighthouse of the Grand Canyon, because this would have had a thousand foot high uh, fountain of lava, and you can see this from like Desert View in Grand Canyon National Park. So this would have been seen over a vast area when it was is erupting. The highest point in that area? Um, it's actually close. Um, the the actual top of Mount Trumbull's on the north side right there, so that's the original vent. What's really interesting too about this, if you do the Trumbull Trail, which is a really nice trail, if you don't mind steep, um, the original eruption is a very gray basalt lava flow. This is very red, and so you have these really vibrant red cinders sitting on top of gray. So Mount Trumbull is a, a series of cinder cones or one big? Just one, yeah. Oh, okay. One big sort of cow pad of lava. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I want to do one last thing with our video here. Um, these lava flows were very voluminous. Lots came out of the ground. And one of them that was so special was the Black Ledge flow. It came out somewhere there. And so much lava came out, it flowed down. Many of these went miles and miles down the canyon. This one kept going. 
kept going. He kept going. <laughs> All the way to the end of the Grand Canyon. That flow went 84 miles. And it could have gone even further, but erosion has removed um, if it did. So we know at least 84 oh, miles, though. So that's it right there. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, oh, that you're looking at that. That's actually dead plants, believe it or not. So it it stopped. Like the last bit is like right in here. Uh, so yeah, hoping to see that on the raft trip. Um, so this is the west end of the Grand Canyon. So Lake Mead, this is tech, so this, that's why it looks dark, is the oh, Lake cool. Mead plants yeah, that are yeah. dead. Because yeah. um, the water actually used to back up with the yeah. lake just a little bit yeah, yeah. in there. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's the, the anticline, the Virgin River anticline, where it's all bowed up. Yeah, and that, yeah, and so that's related to the subduction of the Farallon plate um, a long time ago. But it, yeah, it, it's a beautiful, it's a classic example. I like to bike over there, just, I could <laughs> look at it all the time, it's so cool. Um, so if any of you are familiar with Washington and Oregon, and we'll, look, we'll get into this, too, a little bit when we talk about, um, is it seriously 1040? Um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's where the, the uh, Pacific Plate, or actually not the Pacific Plate, the Juan de Fuca Plate is diving under Washington, Oregon, and that's what makes the, the big one, the 9.0 magnitude quake, um, one of these days. Um, so it's where the seafloor goes under the continent. Um, uh, yeah, so basically, yeah, so it goes way inboard. Um, the Farallon, when it subducted, is thought to have subducted very shallowly, and so it was right under North America, and it was basically bowing things up. There's lots of those um, arcs. Um, and then other places, it's uh, called the severe, oh gosh darn it. Anyways, it, doesn't, it didn't bow, it, it broke. So just imagine sweeping broken glass with a broom and it made it into big plates that all sit on each other in Utah. So that's the severe, a little erogeny, but yeah. So you know John Delaney at UW, he did the first ever IP-based live feed going down to the seafloor after mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. I was on the back team as a writer. Oh, really? That part of the story that I didn't know it was going to be out here. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. It, it really is. It, I mean, it came way in. I mean, you think you're talking about there used to be a subduction zone off of California, which is, is dead now. It's now the San Andreas Fault. But yeah, it was pushing on things and impacting our area right here. So over a huge area. Mm -hmm. The which one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, geologists literally come from all over the world to, to see our area because there's so much in such a small area. It's really almost ridiculous. <laughs> All right, well, this is a much shorter video. Hurricane Cliffs, St. George, Pine Valley Mountains. Yeah. All right, we know this area. Um, so the fault, the Hurricane Fault goes right through here, this Ash Creek. Um, and you notice this black, dark material is lava flow. There's lava flow. There's a little bit at the radio towers back there, up here. It's all the same lava flow. So why is it at different elevations? So I'm going to explain that, but I wanted to show you one thing that's just fun. That it, when you look at Google Earth and you like looking at the landscape, look at this. That's an incised meander. So that is an, the old river channel of Ash Creek, but there was an earthquake, that giant piece slumped a certain way, and Ash Creek decided this was the better place to go, and so it cut itself a new path. So this is an abandoned uh, stream channel. <coughs> There's just more shots of the, we're gonna go up I-15. Mm. <coughs> 
And so this is an area where volcanism helps geologists understand what's going on around here. They figured out that the flow actually came from these cinder cones right here, right off the freeway. They're really hard to see. Is that his name? Good. Yep, heading uphill. And then at this exit, when you drive past this, Google Earth, you I mean, it's not great resolution, but you look at this, this is classic cinders. There's another cinder cone right here that's mostly eroded. So it came from one of those. And now the lava flow that came out of the lowland there is way up high. All right, so we're gonna pause on this for a couple of things. If you've been up to the Kolob Reservoir, I don't know if you've heard, but there's actually quartz monzonite boulders from the Pine Valley Mountains way up over here. Yeah, so, you know, those boulders did not roll up the hill. <laughs> uh, what happened, and this is, this area, so you've got about, oops, geez, 1,300 feet between the, the freeway and the top of the ridge there. This has moved 1,300 feet over time. And so they tested the lava flow. It's 850,000 years old. So that means in 850,000 years, that's how much the land on the right has dropped relative to the land on the left. And it may be more that this is lifting up because the Colorado Plateau is rising. It's still rising. And I believe the action on the fault is about a millimeter every two years, but it doesn't do that. Like it doesn't do anything for quite a while and then all of a sudden we get a big, you know, 7.0 quake um, and it rises. So what happened is those boulders ended up over at the, you know, Kolob Reservoir and now this has dropped and that's an impossibility now. So just a neat thing to help us understand just how much our, our land is moving here. I mean, really, truly, everything around us is moving. My husband has found lots of seashells out of the Kolob Reservoir. Oh, really? Yep. Then, in one of the, what that have been, was it the Ky Kaibab Formation maybe? Yeah, all right, so we're gonna leave that, get back to the other piece. Um, yeah. So as I go through this, slideshow going again. I'm just gonna talk about, you know, types of volcanoes to help us understand what we have here. Um, all of these eruptions start in the mantle. And it's either going to be at the very outside of the mantle where there's this big melt zone that's been discovered, just pockets of magma all over the planet, um, right at the top of the mantle. Um, or it could be hot spots. And hot spots are where you've got magma coming from basically the lower mantle Earth's core in these jets and just coming all the way to the crust and erupting. Classic example of that is Hawaii. So there's our Hawaiian islands right there, but look at that. These are all Hawaiian islands, all the way to Asia. This hot spot has been doing its thing for a very long time. And the reason you got a trail of islands is the hot spot's staying still and the ocean plate's moving over it and burning, you know, through, 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 through. Um, and it's still doing that to this day. So um, believe it or not, Yellowstone actually did the same thing off of our coast, but all of those volcanoes got subducted. Um, but there is actually a trail of Yellowstone's eruptions um, all the way to where, wherever it is, somewhere there, um, today. So hotspot eruptions are very low in silica. And silica is the name of the game when it comes to lavas. The more silica you have, the thicker the lava, the more viscous, the more gas it can hold to explode. But Hawaiian type lavas are very low in that in silica. And so they flow like those rivers of lava, right? That we've seen. And it leaves behind cinders, scoria. Lava flows like this, it's you know, very black dark brown, dark gray rock. This is, makes some of the best columnar basalt. We don't have a hot spot here. But the question is why is all of our lava here in the St. George area like Hawaii? That's a mystery, or it was a mystery, 
and at the end of the show, I'll be telling you exactly why. So you got to wait. <laughs> yes. All right, so the next type is decompression, volcanism, and I wish I had more time to go into this, but we actually already introduced the topic of uh, subduction zones, where we had the ocean plate going under California, still going under Washington, Oregon, and when it does that, it creates friction and pushes up mountain ranges of different heights. And believe it or not, we actually had, is that east? Yeah, or west. So there used to be a mountain range over in Nevada and eastern California that had peaks up to 20,000 feet high up until about 30 million years ago because of that subduction action. And so when you do that, you end up with these big mountain ranges. But as you can see from this next picture, most of the structure is underground, the root. And so when you have all that friction pushing up a giant mountain range, imagine this giant plug of rock, and it stays up, elevated, so long as there's some pressure, the subduction zone, keeping it up. Well, the subduction zone off of California died when the East Pacific rise, which is what was the thing that makes new seafloor actually subducted. So no new pressure. Well, the crust is sitting on the mantle. The mantle is goo, you know, soft, not a good thing to be standing on and the whole mountain range collapsed to the west. So here's this next one shows a nice illustration of that. Look at that area right there. Also notice Nevada doesn't seem, the shape seems wrong, it's a little narrow. California, a little narrow, you know, Arizona, Utah doesn't quite look right. But let's get this animation going. And that, that's the East Pacific rise that made the new seafloor going in both directions. It goes under California. Pressure's gone. Everything stretches out. And now it's, yes, and now it's the San Andreas Fault. I've been following, I don't know if any of you watch Nick Zentner, he's a geologist up at Central Washington University. He's been doing some new stuff that there were previous San Andreas Faults that actually moved rock from Baja, Mexico, clear up to like the Puget Sound uh, in Washington. Um, they found a T-Rex bone in some of those old rocks that have no business being there. So it, this, is, this has happened several times. Um, but yeah, so it stretched out the west, and believe it or not, it used to be half the distance to the ocean from here that it is today. That's how much stretching extension has occurred. Now this, is nice. The only thing, ignore that arrow to the right because everything here stretched to the west. And what's key about this for volcanism, when you had that giant mountain range, um, so that giant mountain range was pushed down and it pushed the mantle down. So best way to make this make sense is think about I don't know, baking at high elevation, you have to bake it for longer because it's not as hot. Um, or if you're boiling water, the higher elevation you get, you have to, the water boils at a lower temperature. Pressure determines when something goes from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas. And so when that giant mountain range was here and then collapsed, the mantle came up, moved from higher pressure where it couldn't melt to lower pressure where it did. And it melted all through the basin and range. So um, that's why we have lots of basin and range volcanism. But that's not our story here either. Okay, what's going on? So if you go up to, uh, in Nevada, there's a lunar craters volcanic field. This is the famous rocking chair. SEMA volcanic field in Mojave Preserve. Amboy crater. You know, the mantle is leaking. Yeah, so it is letting, it is just letting that stuff up as it's melting. All right, third type, and this is that subduction zone thing again. Really quick with this, because this gets into the explosivity of the Cascade volcanoes. When the ocean plate is going under North America or any of the continents, it's dragging down water. It's dragging down hydrate minerals that have water in their mineral structure, and it's getting cooked as it gets, goes down further and further. So you have water that's 1,000 degrees, 1,500 degrees. Well, you might say, well, why isn't it evaporating and just 
going up as steam. It can't. It's trapped. It can't leave. And so you have water now that's basically supercritical. This water changes its properties and does one thing very importantly. It lowers the melting point of silica. And silica and oxygen are the two most common things in Earth's crust. And so now we have all this melted silica in the magma. And over time, that water helps more and more of the silica get uh, melt and becomes enriched in silica. So it's no longer like 45% silica. It's, it's going up. And it gets real viscous. And because of all that water, it's got a lot more water in it. So that's why these volcanoes are so explosive. When they get up to the surface and erupt, you've got this really sticky mass of magma that's maybe 5% water. The water wants out. The water is 1,500 degrees, maybe, or more. And it's putting incredible pressure on the magma that's holding it. But the magma is surrounded by Earth, and so it's all contained. It's pressurized until it gets up to the actual volcano itself. Pressure starts going down. And like with Mount St. Helens, what happened, there was that massive landslide off the north face. Suddenly, the magma that was at tens of thousands, maybe, of pounds per square inch is in the air. And poof, it goes. So, um, when you have these subduction zone volcanoes, they can be really explosive. This one is um, on the left there, I think, was Lassen. Or you get these much thicker lava flows that don't go very far. They don't flow like Hawaii. A uh, good example is, is think of those, you know, monkeys, you know, the, the barrel of monkeys where they have their hooks. Um, so the more silica you add to the magma, the more clotted it gets because all these molecules are joining up. Now, if you're actually a chemist, or this is not, just ignore that. I just wanted to show, in these stickier magmas, you get lattices. You get these networks, polymerized, um, and so it gets really sticky. Now, you can actually get even more silica in there. You get your dacites. That, probably the last one I forgot to mention is andesite. You add more silica, you get dacite. Mount St. Helens was a dacite eruption. And also, the, it starts being not black and Dark gray starts being much lighter colored, usually. Mount Pinatubo, that was another day site eruption. Mount Mazama, day site. Although, curiously, Wizard Island there in the, in the lake is a basaltic eruption. Sometimes, though, you don't get explosions. You don't get the big, uh, violent explosions. If they've been reduced in gas, they just, just get really sticky. So take a look at Mount Eldon there. This flagstaff, look at these. Those are the lobes of those very sticky lavas, and they did not go very far. So San Francisco volcanic field is incredible. All the types of eruptions are there. Um, caldera eruptions, they can be, you know, you can get over 70% silica. And now you're talking about a lot of monkeys joining up. <laughs> topaz Mountain, if you want to go dig for a topaz and some other gemstones, it's in the rhyolite there. Rhyolite is a very sticky lava flow that's over 70% silica. And then the Yellowstone. You know, Yellowstone's eruptions are all going to be high silica, extremely explosive. This is a rhino kill site in uh, Nebraska where one of the Yellowstone caldera's eruptions killed them all. And so it would have been a cloud like this, except miles high, moving maybe hundreds of miles an hour across the landscape. And some of those uh, clouds, they're so hot, as the ash settles, they actually weld back together. And you can get deposits like this. This is all ash from Peach Springs Tuff, um, which is right along the freeway. Uh, this is, this is, again, older stuff. This, this actually happened from the same reason that the Pine Valley Lacolith formed. Um, and then this also is more um, rhyolite with some opal in it. Um, can get, rhyolite can start to turn kind of pinkish. And pumice is another very high silica uh, eruptive thing. And we're going to talk about that again in a minute. Um, and then obsidian. So, so a pumice is where there's a lot of gas, a lot of water, a lot of carbon dioxide, and it puffs up like popcorn. Obsidian is almost no gas. And so it, it doesn't have a lot of bubbles in it. And I've got some samples of those uh, up here as well. Now, I better mention Yellowstone, because that always comes up. You know, it's overdue, right? The internet says. Uh, but it's not. It's actually far from an eruption. And right now, the magma chamber is about 15% melted. 
it needs to be about 50% melted to, to erupt. And that's going to take at least a thousand years for the Yellowstone hotspot to send up enough hot new magma to melt all that. So you don't have to worry. It will erupt again, but it's not overdue. That was just a coincidence. Those three eruptions had a, a seemingly a same time interval. So this is a nice way to compare eruption sizes. We've got St. Helens right there, a little tiny thing. Uh, got your Yellowstone, Long Valley in Southern California, Toba that almost killed the human species. Um, Wawa Springs. Does anyone know where that's at? No? You got it. It's about 150 miles from here. The biggest known eruption in the world was about 150 miles to the north uh, of us. <laughs> yep. Um, so just north of Modena. So, yeah. So, mm -hmm. And so you've also got the Indian Peaks there. Those were several other giant eruptions. They just didn't put it on this thing. Um, okay. So now let's talk about why these volcanic eruptions are so dramatic. I've hinted at this already a little bit. It's very simple. It's water and it's carbon dioxide. There's lots of water in Earth's mantle. Lots of carbon dioxide. There's actually more water, it's thought, many times more water in the mantle than in all the oceans of the world. But it's all spread out. So there's not like pockets of water down there. It's, all, it's like one water molecule surrounded on all sides by mantle rock. Um, and until there's a melt and things start to rise and leave the mantle, can those gases, the carbon dioxide and the water, come together to start making the show? So this is just some, just some drawings of how the magma first rises. It is just exactly like a lava lamp. And the, the mantle, like I said, it's, it's soft. It's soft, but very hot. And this stuff just gently pushes its way through because liquid magma is more buoyant. It's lighter than what's around it. And if you don't believe me that it's really gooey down there, these are rocks that have been under incredible pressure and heat. And you can see that it's liquid, or well, not liquid, plastic, and this stuff can move right through it. The Russians tried to drill down further than anybody else. They got about seven miles down, and they kept losing their drill bits, because at that point, they weren't drilling into brittle stuff. They were drilling into this stuff, and the bits kept falling off, and they couldn't get any further. There was also tons and tons of water down there. I don't know if you've been up to uh, Milford. There's a geothermal plant up there, which is a really great um, technology. I love it. Um, but they have problems. Um, it's geothermal plants all over the world, they're trying to get down to the really hot stuff, but it's also the really soft rock, and it's hard to drill to where they need to get to the temperatures. And then the other thing that I found out from a geologist who used to work in that industry, that's why I put this thunder egg in there, there's a lot of dissolved silica in that water, and it's forming agate on their pipes. <laughs> you know, talk about hard water, right? So. Yeah, so there's technological issues there. They're now experimenting, I guess, with ultra-high-powered lasers to blast down. But yeah, so there's, there's challenges. Um, so this, last, this next bit is how the magma rises. I, just, I was fascinated by this and wanted to understand exactly what's happening. So I put in here our hot air balloon. That's our magma rising up. Most of that is just liquid rock. But believe it or not, our magmas here have about a half a percent to one percent water, and a half a percent carbon dioxide. They're dissolved in sort of like their liquid or supercritical size, so they're not puffed up yet, but they are lower density than the rest of the liquid rock, and so they start to rise through the magma plume, and they are all up here at the top, so it's like a foamy head on the top of your magma body. And as this light magma is going up, it's hitting the brittle rocks. And it's not able to move them to the side. So what's going to get our lava on the surface to erupt? And we're going to bring in our friends water and carbon dioxide. About seven miles down, carbon dioxide, even under those terrible pressures, is able to come out of solution and become a gas. 
and it's a gas, so it fits in the tiniest of cracks, and it's under huge pressure, and it pops them open. It pops open the faults, the cracks, and then the magma follows. And as it continues to move up into lower and lower pressures, now the water comes out, and the water starts popping open the cracks, and the magma follows. And so the magma is able to get to the surface so long as the crust there is just broken enough. There's enough faults, there's enough cracks that it can make it. A lot of these plumes actually never make it. They just, they just peter out and don't ever erupt. But the ones that do had enough gas to clear a path. And there's one other piece to this that I just, I just love. If you took, here's our magma body, forgot to use this. Um, here's our magma rising. And if you took, if this was all it's this soda here and you evaporated it, how many of these do you think would fill, um, how many bottles would the, the, the water vapor fill? Anyone want to guess? Well, that's, that's, yeah, you're close. At the incredibly high temperatures of lava, um, about 4,000. That's how much volume at very high temperatures water takes up. Even at, at room, or not room temperature, at 212 degrees, it would fill 1,700 of these. So you think about the potential volume in that gas, that water that's trying to expand into its gas form, that's where that power comes from. Carbon dioxide doesn't expand nearly that much, but it also helps. All right. This is one of the reasons you don't want to use river rock for a campfire ring. <laughs> we'll do that two more times. <laughs> so that's water in a crack at a high temperature. That's the power that it has. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, of course, this is also why water is so great to make power, and it used to run locomotives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's a way of just saying that water that, and its gas phase is, are so strong that it just it goes in, and just like fracking, pops open these cracks. It, and it's, it's incredible, the pressures involved. Tens of thousands of PSI. Okay. Next little thing here, I want to just talk about the sequence of events for an eruption that we have around here. The first phase, and this is, gets back to those gases, right? Um, if I was to shake this up, Luann, where's their, don't they have the um, aprons for the demo? We're going <laughs> to, uh, no, uh, ponchos, uh, no. Um, so this is under incredible pressure now, and if I put a, just a pinhole in the top of this, which is what the vent is. I mean, if we took the cap off, that, that, that would go off pretty quick. But if I just put a little pinhole, we could actually probably get this thing to spray for quite a while. And that's what's going on the first phase of one of our eruptions around here. At the top of the magma, you got all those gases, and it's blasting out the magma. The magma is not coming out here on its own power. There's gases below ground that are blasting it out, just like if you shook up a soda. And that lasts for months, can last even for a couple of years. You get your strombolian activity like this with the beautiful showers of sparks or cinders. And then once the gases are pretty well used up, the magma is still light, relatively, and it needs to come out of the ground. This is SP crater again. Notice right there, it didn't come out of the top, it came out of the bottom. This is just a whole bunch of rock popcorn, as far as that lava is concerned. This is really light. And so when that lava phase, after the gases are all vented off, the lava actually floats part of the cinder cone and flows out under it. And what can happen a lot of times is you'll see cinder cones busted open on one side because pieces of the cinder cone floated away on top of the lava flow. So that's, if you hike the Santa Clara cinder cone, why well, you don't see solid lava in the crater. Okay, so this is just a couple of neat get the volume up here. Let's we'll blast you out. Uh, this is um, whoa. Uh -oh. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, we can. Let's see. 
Oh, I swear if this. <laughs> I wish. One of these days it will be. So this is in Indonesia. All right, and this one is one of my favorites. And this is just water and carbon dioxide, folks. That glowing is the gases are so hot they're incandescent. So that's glowing water. So you start to understand the power we're dealing with here with these things. Now they're not all dangerous like that. This is one of the benefits of low silica Hawaiian type magmas, which is what we have around here, where the gases come out really easy. Yeah, so when, you, when you've got magma that's low silica, it's so fluid that the gases don't get explosive. It's able to vent safely. But when you've got really sticky magmas, this is like a Mount St. Helens type eruption. Um, this is just one piece of sticky magma that's going to blow. Mount St. Helens did this for nine hours. And basically, if you imagine this root of magma, the first explosion was just the very top part in the air. It was just pow, and then the next part is now exposed to the air. So it goes pow, 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 all the way down. It took nine hours. Um, but this one is a nice little. Even that's what one in Mexico. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. So you get these dramatic explosions, which is very different from the Hawaiian style that's very gentle. This one, I think, is also in Indonesia. So that's your um, <laughs> sticky magma. And if you, if you want to do this at home, <laughs> I would say don't ask me how I know this. <laughs> but uh, it was not a fun day when I was cleaning egg yolk off the break room ceiling. <laughs> All right, we're getting close to the end here. Um, back to pumice. It is really rock popcorn. It's very sticky, high silica, full of water. But what's different from pumice, from like a, a cinder that we have around here, is when this stuff comes out of the volcano, it's a small little blob, but full of water. And all of a sudden in the air, all that water can turn into water gas, poofs it up. And the, the magma is so sticky that it doesn't break apart, just like popcorn. So um, popcorn, same thing going on. You've got your popcorn in the oil or in the microwave. This starch in here liquefies as it gets hotter and hotter, but it's got about 17% water. There's a statistic for you. And that water, as it gets hotter and hotter, wants to escape. And it's around 350 degrees where it has the power to break the shell. And then your popcorn pops, and there you go. All right, at long last, we are here at why we have volcanoes in St. George. 
this is a new area of research. It's still controversial, it's still being studied, but it comes from the field of seismic tomography, where scientists are studying earthquake waves as they move through the mantle and the crust. And they wanted to understand what's going on below the Colorado Plateau. Why is it rising? <clears throat> what's going on down there? And they found this huge structure. It's weird. The Colorado Plateau, just think of it as a big table, big round table. If you ever had a, a shoe where the glue starts to come off and your sole flops down, that's what's happening. That blue is a big piece that's hundreds of miles across falling down into the mantle for some reason. This is one of the controversial things. The seismic tomography really has shown it's there, but why exactly is still controversial and being studied? But it's falling away. The thing that's so key about this, if this is falling away, something has to replace it. And that's the asthenosphere, which is the hotter part of the mantle down here, which comes around and now sits right under the Colorado Plateau. And that is adding lots of heat, which helps rocks expand, makes them buoyant, helps the plateau lift, and is causing lots and lots of melts. And those melts are traveling from somewhere out here to the edges of the Colorado Plateau, including us right here. You know, New Ingrid, St. Uh, Flagstaff, all these, over to Albuquerque, um, up even into southern Colorado. That's why we have our volcanism. We've got a sthenosphere really close to the surface making melts, and that's why our magmas, our volcanic, volcanics, are so similar to Hawaii. This stuff is coming out really fast. It doesn't have time to add a bunch of silica, get thick, get explosive most of the time. And so our eruptions are very similar to Hawaii's. We don't have a hot spot, but we do have a warm spot. <laughs> All right, and this is the paper. If anyone wants to look at this afterwards, I'd, if you want to read it. Um, well, I think we've already answered this question. <laughs> it's gonna be something like this here in, <laughs> in our area, you know. Not terrible, but not good. Uh, Scientists are studying this stuff. They know when these earthquakes are happening. There's actually magma moving under Sunset Crater right now, which is weird because it's not gonna erupt again, but there is gonna be another eruption near it. Um, because of earthquake wave studies, they know that. So this is from La Palma. This erupted two years ago now, but we can expect scenes like this. Spanish. <laughs> uh, it's a Spanish island um, off the African coast, I think. My arrows have moved. Um, shoot. <laughs> 